try and set the stage for what should be a great year of NFL action. There's a handful of teams that potentially can compete for a Super Bowl championship. Confusion and uncertainty this year more than some in the past. This team looks like it's ready to make a move, but we just don't know if it's bad or good this year. J.J. McCarthy is eventually going to take over, but it's like it's a no-lose situation for them. I mean, they suck. They were 7 Only ten. on Sports Grid. Hopefully they learned their lesson. Hey, this ain't the NBA, bro. You don't have six fouls, and they will check you on this stuff. And Brooks has a reputation coming into this. You can tell the refs are watching them, and they were on them all the time. This was 10, 12 years ago. Canada playing Greece with that type of lead that they had. They probably would have mentally crumbled and lost that game to Greece by three or four points in the final minute of that ball game. Sports Rage Late Night, only on Sports Grid. Say the under has the correct juice to the six and a half win total for the New York Giants. It's a losing season. It's a bad season in the greater New York area. Is Brian Dayball and is Joe Shane back next year? As a Giants fan, what are you looking forward to? Absolutely nothing. You're hoping like the Yankees make a long enough run so you can forget about the Giants. The early line, only on Sports Grid. The bottom of this field is a bunch of guys, quite frankly, that aren't on the tour, aren't on the DP tour, aren't on the Corn Ferry tour. You know, the top 25 or so in this field, I mean, you've, you've got Rory, you've got Lowry, you've got Scheffler, you know, all four Americans, Min Woo Lee and Jason Day, and uh, you go to uh, Mito Pereira and Joaquin Neiman out of Chile. So, you know, it, it really is pretty deep. In Game Live, prime time, only on Sp- Good morning. Welcome to Newswire here on Sports Grid. Today is Friday. The NFL preseason is underway. A couple of games last night we will review. Also get to the very latest on the NFL field with the Miami Dolphins as Adam Beasley joins us a little bit later in the show. They have a preseason game coming up against the Atlanta Falcons. Carlin Gay joins us from Sporting News as Team USA with a very close call as they chase the gold with Serbia and also Jim Ghazali with the very latest on sports betting in Kentucky. Those are just some of the stories and topics that we're following for you here on this Friday edition of the show. And as I mentioned, Team USA, they may get the gold in the end, but it has not been the easiest of runs for them. As a matter of fact, folks, if you bet Team USA in every single one of these matches, whether it was the exhibitions or the group stage or the medal stage, and you bet them against the spread, folks, you lost a lot of money. I mean, Team USA, they may get that gold, but they are not helping you out as far as covering the spread along the lines. In fact, Serbia led the game at the half. If you watch this game, you thought that maybe there was a chance that they could pull the big upset off. But in the end, the final score, folks, 95 to 91, Team USA wins. And they are on the doorstep now of the gold medal. And I guess that's all anybody will remember in the end. But sports betters, we remember things a little bit differently Uh, Kevin Durant has had a great ceremony at the Olympics, to say the very least. And last night after the game, Durant even admitted to the media that this is one of those special moments along the line of his career. How can you not celebrate a win like that? Look at all our families. Look at this. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's what it's about. You know what I mean? We all come together as one on the other side of the world like this. Start USA chance. Our our section start USA Special tonight, man. So we got to celebrate. I'm not going to act like it's not. You know what I mean? I know we want to win a goal, but we got to celebrate the small moments, too. Everybody here going to remember this night for the rest of their lives. That's how special this is. And because we came back and we, we showed how together we were in that fourth quarter. It was, it was incredible. Team USA with a victory against Serbia. Now, one of the more bizarre stories that have come out of the Olympics will be yesterday as Noah Lyles ends up winning the bronze medal and then afterwards reveals that he tested positive for COVID just a couple of days ago. And so 
sort of strange here that he, after the race, admitted he had it. Would he have admitted this had he won the gold? What is the eligibility requirements regarding this? To say the least, very strange turn of events. Lyles had an incredible Olympics, but a uh, strange result yesterday and a strange admission afterwards. And again, why not say this before the race is what I think a lot of people are asking this morning. All right, a lot of people are asking uh, this morning about this very strange story with Marvin Harrison Jr. and Fanatics. And I've read this story several times, to be candid with you here on the show, and I'm not completely sure exactly what is going on here. But to say the least, I'm going to try to break it down for you. Marvin Harrison Jr., first round pick, uh, has a deal in place with Fanatics, at least according to Fanatics, and he signed off on a deal. Now this includes signing items, memorabilia. I think I saw 35,000 items he agreed to sign. Give them some gear, right? Like they could put it on uh, sports cards, sell it on their site. Harrison Jr. says he has no agreement with Fanatics now. So they're being sued by Fanatics. And I just said the word they're being sued because the reason why is Marvin Marvin Harrison Jr. says he didn't sign the agreement because his dad signed the agreement. But meanwhile, as part of Marvin Harrison Jr.'s personal company, uh, his dad is a signer of the company for his memorabilia and things like that. I don't get it. So uh, Fanatics is going to re-sue Marvin Harrison Jr., whether or not Marvin Harrison Sr. is involved in this as well. But uh, it does seem like Marvin Harrison Jr. signed a deal with Fanatics to give up his gear and sign autographs and get paid. And now maybe he's found a better deal. Just doesn't want to do it. I don't know. That's what's going on. NBA Christmas Day games have been announced. This is a long ways away, Frank. Spurs at the Knicks in five months. Get ready. Bet it now. (laughs) Timberwolves, Mavericks. 76ers Lakers, uh, 76ers Celtics, Lakers Warriors, Nuggets Suns. What is the one thing that you can guarantee about these games, Frank, on Christmas Day? What is the only thing that you can guarantee? Knicks win is what Frank says. No, what you can guarantee is I will be working on Christmas Day here on Sports Grid. I've done it every single year since I've come. So there you go. That's what you can guarantee. You'll hear me breaking those games down. France beat Germany 73-69 to at the Olympics. Victor Wembayama and France headed to the gold medal game. Another upset. Second consecutive Olympics after beating Germany by four yesterday in the semifinals. Wemby has been fantastic. And they move on. And again, playing in front of the home crowd certainly seemed to help. U.S. 4x400 relay team has advanced to the gold medal. Quincy Wilson, 16 years old, and Team USA is going to play for the gold on sat run for the gold, I should say, on Saturday. Christoph Razovinsky of Hungary wrapped up the Olympic events in the Sign River by winning the men's 10 kilometer marathon race. Congratulations to him. Vinish Fogat has filed an appeal as asked the sport's highest court to aware, uh, award her a shared silver medal after being disqualified from her Paris Olympics final for not coming in at the proper weight limit. The decision is expected to be issued before the end of the Olympic Games. All of the coverage of the Olympics this weekend, gold medal for soccer, basketball, etc., broken down for you today on Pharrell Coast to Coast at 3 o'clock Eastern. Jerry Jones has yet to give a brand new contract to wide receiver CeeDee Lamb as the season approaches. And in a very bizarre commentary yesterday, Jerry Jones just said that it's not a priority for him and then paused and then started talking about a lot of other stuff. It was very odd, to say the least. But as of right now, no new deal for the league's best wide receiver last year. And then a comment on social media from CeeDee Lamb posted late last night with three letters, which were L-O-L. All right. CeeDee Lamb wants to get paid. Not getting paid. I got you. Everybody else getting paid. CeeDee Lamb not getting paid. By the way, Brandon Ayuk, who was traded on social media uh, 46 times over the last week, is still a member of the uh, San Francisco 49ers. All right. Last night in preseason action in the NFL, the Giants beat the Lions 14-3. to That was the final there. Drew Locke got hurt in that game. Uh, Also, the New England Patriots beat the uh, Carolina Panthers 17-3. to Quarterback Joe Milton had a really nice debut for the Patriots through a 38-yard touchdown pass. 
Atlanta Falcons place Rondell Moore on the reserve injured list. He's out for the year with a knee injury. They just got him in the offseason. And the Saints have signed linebacker Pete Warner. Three years, $25 million deal, $17.5 million guaranteed. Yesterday, we learned that Pedro Griffal was fired as manager of the Chicago White Sox. They also let go of pretty much all the members of his staff, except for Grady Sizemore. And he's now been named the interim manager of the White Sox, although it looks like they're going to do a full search after the season. The Atlanta Braves are falling apart. They lost four games a row at home, courtesy of the Milwaukee Brewers. They're now officially out of a playoff spot for the first time since 2022. Herman Marquez returned for the Rockies. He threw in one game and got hurt again. He is out for the season. And Justin Verlander is going to return pretty soon to the Houston Astros. He's going to have a rehab start at AAA Sugarland. Coming up, he's 41 years old. And all the Astros are hoping for is that this guy can get healthy for September and carry them back to the postseason, which the Astros are no stranger to. All right, coming up. In about 15 minutes from now, Team USA's women's basketball team is getting ready to take on Australia and their big favorites in the game. So we thought we would get a closer look at it with Carlin Gay of the Sporting News. He'll join us on the show. We'll also preview France and Belgium. That's the other matchup today at 3 o'clock Eastern. So give you some picks against the spread. Coming up next here on this Friday edition of Newswire. And we'll be right back after this. And McGregor Sports and Entertainment is now an owner of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Welcome to the big leagues. David Feldman, baby, he did it. He's now an owner of BKFC with us, and we're going to take this motherfucking thing all the way to the top now. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. We have 15 minutes until Team USA plays Australia in women's basketball. So rather than do a one-minute intro about who Carlin Gay is from Sporting News, I'm not going to waste any time here because we need a pick against the spread or maybe a total. Let's bring Carlin in. Uh, fun game yesterday between Team USA and Serbia. Uh, that has been the, the deal with the men. 
uh, going for the gold here, Carl. And they can't cover a spread if they're you-know-what dependent on it. Can Team USA cover <laughs> this big number? I mean, they can't. Carl, it's true. They're not covering any games. They covered one the whole, the whole entire time. The women have been a little bit better. 15.5-point favorites today against Australia. Total of 161 and a half. I turn the floor over to you, Carlin. What happens in the game today? Yeah, it's, this is the this is a classic scenario that I think Australia just doesn't have enough uh, weapons in their in their tool bag to, to to compete with Team USA. I mean, uh, one of their best players in Beck Allen is not available for you know Australia. They, she hasn't been available for the entire tournament. Picked up an injury right before, like a couple weeks before uh, they went over to France, and um, you know that scoring and the defensive side of the ball really because her length and her size is really going to be missed against Team USA. They haven't Australia hasn't really missed that so far in the tournament. Clearly, they're in the semifinals. They're going to play for a medal no matter what. But they're going to miss it, especially against Team USA, because the Americans just have so much more size, so much more athleticism than most teams around the world, Australia being one of them, especially when you don't have Beck Allen. So I do expect Team USA to cruise here and, and, and run that uh, win total up to 70 or 59 straight wins in the Olympic Games. Uh, and, yep. you know, they're going to cover this spread as well. It's going to be close. First quarter is going to be really close back and forth. But once you get into the bench, the depth comes into play, and that's where the Americans will you know, extend that spread and, and definitely cover it with ease. I feel like betting uh, this one player on Australia, just because I love the name here. Look at this. I've never, I've never heard of this woman. Ezzy Mag Beggar. 20 points yeah, or more. Magbeger. at 10. I'm rooting for this one, Carlin. I mean, I have never seen this name in my life until we just showed yeah. it here on your screen there. I know Asia Wilson. She's minus 154. Uh, Brianna Stewart. I mean, Asia Wilson's been so good. It feels like that's, that, I mean, even at minus 150, I'm sort of tempted here. But Mag Beggar, I'm going to I'm gonna put a little on Mag Beggar just because I like the name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As he's actually, if you want to, if you want to compare her to someone on Team USA, you brought up Asia yeah. Wilson. She's Australian Asia Wilson. Like she's, she is that really? good. She's a world-class player. She's one of the best players at her position on the world stage starts for, for the Australians. And actually, you know, back in February for this team, she won the MVP of the FIBA Olympic qualifying tournament to get them to the Olympic games. She's a double, double machine. Now, can she score 20 points? Uh, the odds suggest that it's going to be a long shot, and it is, because Team USA has the size advantage to really kind of keep her in check. So I don't expect her to go for 20 points. But where you can put your money if you want to, you know, lay a little juice on, on Ezzy, double-double. She is going to rebound the basketball. Mm. She's going to have to rebound the basketball today if Team USA or if Australia is going to keep it close. Uh, so I, I would I would go more for the double-double. The, the 20 and 10 double-double, that seems like a stretch. But you give me a 12 and 10 or, or 14 and 10, that I could I could stomach that. All right. That's why we have uh, pay Carl in the big bucks to make the appearances on this show, to go <laughs> off our graphic and give us something else. France, Belgium today. Three. I'm I'm an expert at the backup catcher on the Mariners, Carl, and I am not an expert at France and Belgium today. France is four and a half point favorites. They play at three o'clock Eastern today. The total is very low for a women's game here, one forty three and a half. My gosh, that does seem super low for a medal game. But uh, again, I don't know a ton about this. Leaning on you once again here. It seems to me, outside looking in. A lot of the teams that are at home, France, Paris, seem to be doing very well at the Olympics at every level. I don't know if it's home cooking here, but it just seems to keep happening. And that's pretty surprising because, you know, sometimes the home crowd goes against you. You know, once you, you don't get a couple calls going your way, that crowd gets frustrated. They get on the referees and you get out of yourself and start playing out of yourself. But that hasn't happened for both the men's and women's team. We know the men's are in the finals. Women's trying to get there with a win today. And honestly, that total is low to me too, Craig. This is, you know, outside of Team USA, these are two high scoring teams right now in the Olympic Games, right? They're scoring around, uh, I think it's 73, 70, 75 points per game, uh, you know, respectively. And they can hit the three. You know, uh, Belgium destroyed uh, Spain in, in their quarterfinal matchup by hitting 50% in their threes. Uh, you know, we know that France could do that as well. We know France shoots the ball well. They, I think they shot 40% in their in their victory uh, in the quarterfinals. And Marie Johannes had a terrific game, 24 points. She's going to have to play well again today. So I would go over that total, no question about it. And then if you're talking about who's going to win this basketball game, it's going to come down to the three ball. Who is hitting their threes? And I think France getting behind that home crowd, having the guard play that Maureen Johannes brings to the table, Gabby Williams brings to the table, I think that pushes them through. And I know that Emma Messamin 
is the best player in the Olympic Games not playing on Team USA. In fact, she's the best player in the Olympic Games not in the WNBA, currently in the WNBA. So uh, she's the leading scorer of the tournament. Uh, she, she's led Belgium to this point. But I think France and that you know sixth man, which is the crowd, I, I think that's going to be too much for Belgium. And they're really going to feel the loss of their guard, Julie Alamon, here in this game. Julie Alamon is, is a WNBA player. Uh, she is one of the you know co-captains for Belgium. And she's, you know, at a young age, gets up and down the floor and really forces that tempo. They're going to miss her today. They haven't missed her so far in the Olympic Games, but they're going to miss her today going against Marine Johannes. So give me France, and we're going to have a dual, you know, France-USA matchup in, in both gold medal games for men's and women's basketball. Yeah, and, and next week, uh, this will all be over with. So this is our last time to chat about the Olympics. So I want to do that. I'm just going to we, – we made these nice little graphics here, so I want to just show them to you here. But uh, to win the silver – uh, France is a heavy favorite at minus 175. You have Belgium plus 150. And then the, when the bronze, Australia is even money and Belgium plus 195. You've given up, us enough picks, but th that's what those odds are. What will be the story next week, uh, Carlin, of the Olympics for uh, Team USA potentially winning the gold, the women winning the gold as well? What do you think the big stories will be coming out of this thing? 30 seconds left. I think I think LeBron James being the best player at the Olympic Games at age 39 is going to be the story. He's always the story when every steps on the basketball court. And on the flip side, it's just another American dominance, right, for the women. We really have to start to appreciate this. They have not lost. And when they do lose, it's going to be Tyson Douglas sort of upset. It's mm -hmm. going to be the biggest upset we've ever seen. Hmm. Great stuff as always, Carlin. Thanks for sharing all the Olympic knowledge with me on the show. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Today, Conor McGregor, myself, and McGregor Sports and Entertainment is now an owner of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Welcome to the big leagues. David Feldman, baby, he did it. He's now an owner of BKFC with us, and we're going to take this motherfucking thing all the way to the top now. back to Newswire. Adam Beasley, who covers the Miami Dolphins, is going to give us a preview of their game against the Falcons tonight as they play at Hard Rock Stadium. But before we do that, let's hear from some of your favorite people in sports, including maybe a quarterback in the NFL. He doesn't play all that much, but he's really fun to hear from. It's time now for the Sports Grid Sound Off. All 
All right, let's begin with Team USA. They are going for the gold this weekend, probably be the most watched event on television or streaming out of all of the events as Team USA plays for the gold. They had a really close call against Serbia yesterday as they were trailing at the half but came all the way back to win. Our very own Kevin Walsh braving the elements of the rain to get us in and get us a preview of Team USA playing for the gold medal. Going for gold, Team USA men's basketball five on five survives a crazy game and completes the comeback against Nikola Jokic and Team Serbia. Social was on fire uh, with incredible photos and moments and reactions from uh, Steph, LeBron, and Durant uh, pushing this team forward to the goal game where they are going to meet with France. It, it has been Incredible to watch these guys, this team as a whole, Joel Embiid getting big moments as well uh, for this team. And they're set up now as big time favorites against Victor Webinyama and France to win gold. And I got to tell you, I think a comeback like that, being on the ropes, is going to make this team even more memorable and even more special. The question now is who is going to lead Team USA in scoring, LeBron, Durant, Anthony Edwards, and Steph all in the mix, all with a legit shot. Craig, it's back to you. All right, thanks very much, Kevin. Got to get Kevin an umbrella also, by the way. All right, the National Football League has its fair share of good talkers, but there's probably not a better one than the quarterback of the Cleveland Browns. Jameis Winston's on the Browns this year, by the way, if you've been sort of out of it and you may not have realized, played on a number of different teams, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, but every time that he seems to comment, he loves to make news. In fact, when he's all done playing in the NFL, there's no question that he is going to be a broadcaster, but he's not done yet, and he's not done yet defending the starting quarterback of the Cleveland Browns in Deshaun Watson when he was asked about him at a press conference yesterday. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people forget. When you can go out, you can see practice, you can knick-knack, this, that, patty whack, give a dog a bone. Deshaun Watson is going to turn it on. He always going to find a way to shine when the lights come on. Man, I just rhymed. Can, can, I, leave, can I leave off that one? I know that one's going to hit. <laughs> Extremely well liked. Uh, uh, not Deshaun Watson, sorry. Uh, Jameis Winston. Is Jameis Winston going to start for the Browns this year? What would we put the odds on that? I mean, Watson in the past was great. But just hasn't looked anything like himself since going to Cleveland from Houston. Had all those off-the-field issues, too. I'm going to set Deshaun Watson starts at quarterback for the Browns this season, guys and girls. I'm going to set that number at four and a half starts this season for Deshaun Watson. I think he may go over. Uh, Sean McDermott previews the game that he has coming up for the Buffalo Bills. Check it out. As far as the game goes, uh, we're looking forward to playing. Um, we kind of get into this point in training camp where, as you see, some of the skirmishes start to break out. Guys are getting a little ornery, and it's time to go against another opponent here. So uh, we look forward to finishing today's camp and today's practice the right way, but also uh, getting in front of our fans at, at home uh, come this Saturday at 1 o'clock. So um, play time-wise, I know that's, that's what you're looking for. The ones will play. They'll play roughly uh, a quarter, give or take. Um, it's really, to me, it's getting them ramped up and ready to go for the season. It's an important step. Hard to simulate the, the speed of the game. And so getting, those, getting that in preseason is important. Um, going through warm-ups and the energy that comes with playing a game in front of fans uh, and being able to, to manage that. So there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, like I said, it's just another step. This time of the year, it's sort of hard to read through the coaches to see what these things actually mean and how much playing time is going into these games in the preseason. McDermott does tend to be one of those coaches that even in meaningless games does play his guys. He's played Josh Allen in games that have uh, not mean anything, even at the end of the season, meant anything at the end of the season too. All right, coming up next, Jim Ghazali joins us from Legal Sports Report. We'll talk about sports betting in North Carolina, Kentucky, touch on some horse racing in Saratoga as well. You're watching Newswire on Sports Grid. We'll be right back.
happened? What has transpired here at the First Bank Center here in Denver, Colorado? It wasn't just a big night of fight. It was a big night of memorable moments. Conor McGregor with us here in Denver, Colorado. Both left hand from Mark Bull. Right hand, right back from Mike Perry. And Mike Perry now 3-0 in BKFC. Can I get a face-off with Conor McGregor, man? It's an incredible setup here. Incredible matchmaking. Incredible storytelling. Oh, you had to come here. All these fighters that step in here. Warriors, and I all have my respect, and I'm into this game, yeah, we'll be into this, yeah. And we are live here in the Maverick Center, here in the Salt Lake City, Utah, Bowl. what a night it is going to be historic indeed for BKFC 56. Whoever's the king of violence right here, this is going to be a great fight. fighting in the city of angels. We've got the biggest announcement in the BKFC history we're about to make, so let's make that announcement. What's up, Nookamania? The notorious Conor McGregor here. Ladies and gentlemen, the huge announcement that I have for you today. Conor McGregor, myself, and McGregor Sports and Entertainment is now an owner of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Welcome to the big leagues. David Feldman, baby, he did it. He's now an owner of BKFC with us, and we're going to take this motherfucking thing all the way to the top now. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. It's rare to have Jim Ghazali on for weeks and weeks without talking a little horse racing. I'm glad we brought that back here on the show today. I don't know if you guys covered anything Tuesday with uh, with me out here, but we do have a couple of stories surrounding uh, Churchill Downs uh, in Kentucky and also Saratoga horse racing as well. So you'll get your fix with that, those of you tuned in. But again, we have some other stories to touch on as well. Jim, welcome back to Newswire. Thanks for making some time for us today. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good, Craig. Thanks for having me. And by the way, LegalSportsReport.com is where you can read all of the stories that we're going to discuss here on the show. Let's start off with North Carolina as we head toward the final quarter of the year. How has sports betting's outlook been for them in 2024, and what can we expect in the future? Yeah, I think one of the more interesting things when North Carolina uh, launched their, their sports betting market earlier this year, for me at least, was golf and, and NASCAR. And back in, in the springtime, Craig, we, we talked pretty heavily about both of those outfits. So I wanted to kind of check in and see how the golf betting was going in North Carolina. And for the Tar Heel State, it's, it's been doing pretty well. Um, I know the, the tournament there this weekend was delayed yesterday. And I know that that first round just got underway in North Carolina earlier this morning. But overall, North Carolina accounts for about 8% of all golf bets nationwide. So with a top 20 market overall, North Carolina, in terms of sports betting handle widespread, uh, that 8% of total golf bets coming from North Carolina puts it as a a top five golf market uh, nationwide. So certainly over indexing in golf betting. Now, overall golf betting, the PGA Tour told me a couple weeks ago, overall golf betting nationwide is up 20% which is right in line with the overall sports betting landscape. We've seen about 20% year-on-year volume increase. And and a lot of that has to do with a lot of these larger states, more popular states coming online in the last year or so. Um, You know, Massachusetts, Ohio, uh, Kentucky comes to mind. So when I looked into the numbers, there are a handful of states that do break out individual uh, sport-specific statistics and golf being one of them in a, in a handful of states and, and that looked to be more along the lines of about a 10 percent 
increase, but overall golf betting is up. Now, when you look at the, the entire landscape of sports betting, you know, I think to kind of gauge success for individual sports, you want to see how much of that, that overall piece of the pie is growing. Now, while total volume is up, like I've said, that overall market share for golf isn't necessarily up. And in fact, in, in 2022, golf had you know, 1.43% of overall sports betting in 2024. So far, it's been 1.35%. Now, it's worth mentioning that we don't have eyes in every single state in terms of you know specific golf betting figures. There's um, you know, four or five, maybe six states that, that break it out. But in talking to the, the PGA Tour, they are really banking on the live betting markets. We've seen the live betting menu for golf grow uh, substantially over the last you know, six, eight, 12 months. So they're really banking on that. And they did tell me they're not declaring any you know, sort of victories just yet in North Carolina four or five months in, but they are rather pleased with the growth in golf betting, especially from the Tar Heel State, Craig. All right, good notes there on North Carolina. Again, you could read about this column over at LegalSportsReport.com. All right, this one caught me a little bit by surprise. Kentucky Downs adding a new sports betting operator. And uh, Jim, it's a sports betting operator, very popular in Las Vegas. It's Circa Sportsbook. And, and the reason why I guess I find this a little fascinating, Jim, is because Superbook, which was exclusive out of Las Vegas, ended up pulling some of their uh, books or sponsorships in and partnerships in different places in the country. Why has Circa decided to jump into Kentucky? Yeah, so Circa launched their online sports betting app in Kentucky about six or so, uh, a little bit more than that, mid-May. Um, they, they started taking bets in Kentucky online. So this has always really been part of the plan in opening up a, a retail bricks and mortar sports book in the state. Uh, as you know, Craig, there, the state allows the online operators to have uh, agreements with racetracks. So Circa, they have their, their online licensing through uh, Cumberland Run, which is a harness track. And now they're going to be opening a temporary sports book uh, at Kentucky Downs next week. And I, and I say it's temporary because uh, I think they're, they're trying to really capitalize on the start of football season and just get something up and running. All the regulatory hurdles have been cleared. So uh, in speaking with some people there, they said, you know, the, the timing just worked out that football season's on the horizon and they want to be able to offer this. Now, what, what I found interesting is that this is going to be the closest retail sports book to Nashville, which is a very popular uh, market for Kentucky Downs and the, the attached casino there. So what they're hoping is that they're able to draw that crowd from Nashville, Tennessee, that is looking for a more you know traditional style of you know watching football and, and placing a bet on it and, and not being tied to their phone for the entire right. afternoon. Um, so they do get a lot of business from that Nashville market and, you know, Nashville, Tennessee obviously has mobile sports betting, but there's no casinos in Tennessee. So this is certainly a draw for them. And, and you know, as the, the, the horse racing fan that I am, you know, I, I wanted to see how this all matched up with their race dates at Kentucky Downs. They, they have a, a short sort of boutique meet there. It only lasts seven days, but for them, two of those days will co coincide live racing with NFL football. Opening night that Thursday, September 5th, there's live racing during the day at Kentucky Downs. And then all day Sunday, that September 8th, week one of NFL, uh, you'll have live racing there along with that full slate of NFL games. So that Circus Sportsbook opening at Kentucky Downs next week. And then the more permanent, larger build out is expected sometime next summer. All right. Now uh, let's get a final story from you here, Jim, before we let you go for the weekend. Uh, let's hit on Saratoga. You've got some numbers in from horse racing. So here we go, Jim. How are things going in upstate New York? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't let you get away with a, a couple of weeks in a row without uh, talking about horse racing. Um, so we're about halfway through the, the summer racing season up here at Saratoga. And 
it's been been raining uh, seemingly for for the last week, you know, as it has been up and down the the entire East Coast, really, and and that's really affected the racing up here in, in terms of uh, being able to run on the turf, which usually has larger fields, uh, more handle. So halfway through the the meet, handle last year compared to this year is is relatively flat, uh, slight increase really only a couple of thousand dollars, really. Um, and a lot of that has to do with with the rain. Uh, it's taken a, a bunch of races off the turf. You know, last weekend was a big weekend, Whitney Day at Saratoga, and they had uh, two or, or three marquee turf races. Two of them got canceled. One got moved to the dirt. And, and when that happens, a lot of the horses scratch out because they don't want to run on the dirt. So that's affected handle. Attendance kind of walking around there on the weekends um, like I do. It, it just seems a lot quieter than in years past. And speaking with some folks at Naira, it seems like the Belmont Stakes weekend up here in early June you know, really kind of took a lot of the uh, excitement out of the summer. Perhaps some people coming into town for their, their annual trip to Saratoga. They did that back in June for the Belmont rather than this summer. Jim, great stuff. As always, have a great weekend, and we'll catch up with you again next week on Newswire. Thanks, Greg. All right, Jim Ghazali from Legal Sports Report. Dolphins play the Falcons tonight. Who will play? And what is their outlook for the season? Adam Beasley from Pro Football Network joins us next. is now an owner of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Welcome to the big leagues. David Feldman, baby, he did it. He's now an owner of BKFC with us, and we're going to take this motherfucking thing all the way to the top now. Back to Newswire, another night of NFL preseason games, one that we'll focus on here in just a few minutes. Dolphins and Falcons will be played at Hard Rock Stadium. Adam Beasley is covering the Dolphins for Pro Football Network, also covering the National Football League. I feel like, Adam, it has been – I'm going to take a shot at this. I'm going to take a shot. I feel like you have covered in some way South Florida and the Dolphins, I'm going to say, for 12 years – is that is that too is that am I underselling you on that? Is that right? 
Yes, that's uh, close without going over. You'd be good in the prices, right? Uh, I've been here since 06, so 18 years now. That's, I did some years. news work with the Miami Herald for a while, but I have definitely been working media in this market for way too long. Yeah, 18 years. I said 12. I Look, I undersold the guy there, but I've known Adam for a long time, too, at least 10. Uh, okay, so uh, Dolphins going into the season, they've made a lot of different headlines, and there's some more even going on right now with injuries. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's start off with the players who left in the offseason. And, and, you know, honestly, it's, it's you know, some players I think could potentially have an impact, and some I think were more ado about just getting replacements for them, including Shaq Barrett, who we didn't show here, never ended up playing at all for them. Uh, but Van Ginkle went to the Vikings. Wilkins was the big one who signed that contract with the Raiders. Uh, Xavier Howard was fantastic for many years. He left through free agency. And then the Dolphins pivoted by signing Barrett, uh, who is, it says that he's in addition here, but he retired already, Frank. Uh, Odell Beckham Jr., Jonathan Harris. I mean, these are not a ton of names that people know, uh, except for like Calais Campbell, maybe, and a couple of other players. Did they do enough on defense, Adam, to keep up with how good their offense is going to be? Yeah, they, they never were going to be able to replace one for one Christian Wilkins. He's just too dynamic and versatile of a player. Uh, he meant too much of their defense for any one guy to replace. I, I definitely think the Campbell addition has helped, but they're, what they're trying to do is replace him in the aggregate, uh, have enough different parts that kind of makes up for what he brought. Uh, they're going to have a lot more of a rotation. I mean, they're, they're offensive tackles and sealers back this year, Zach Sealer, but he and Wilkins played an obscene amount of snaps last year, and I would assume that was – that would come down for Sealer, certainly. Uh, they're going to need to fill all those snaps for, for Wilkins. I think you're going to see probably – they're going to play – it's going to be an odd man front, so I count defensive ends and nose tackles all in the same batch. And each of those three positions, the three end positions, the nose tackle, I think they're going to have probably seven maybe guys play in that rotation, at the very least six, uh, and just keep throwing bodies in there. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. As you mentioned, the aggregate, we've you know, heard that term on Moneyball before, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the aggregate also was accomplished in the draft where the Dolphins very clearly early on had the idea of, hey, we are going to have to get an edge rusher. That is the key in the NFL, getting to the quarterback. So they drafted Chop Robinson, and naturally there's going to be some other bit players that they will fit in, uh, You know, Jalen Wright being one of those. But let's focus here on Robinson. Uh, you know, I'm following along here as training camp is going. I got to tell you, I haven't seen his name mentioned all that much. So maybe I'm just not uh, reading the right material or seeing the right things here. How has he looked so far? I guess the Elon uh, algorithm has jacked up for you because we've been writing about Chop Robinson a ton. Uh, he's had, uh, <laughs> I would say he's, he's definitely had the most impactful uh, training camp of all the rookies. I think bar none. Uh, he's been uh, pretty active in the backfield. He's not going to be the big edge setter. I think that's why they went out inside Campbell and brought back Emmanuel Agua after Barrett retired, to your point. Uh, but if you're looking for a guy who can give you 30, 35 solid pass rush reps a game, uh, Chop Robinson more than fits that bill. I mean, they're, they're going to need him, particularly early on, because uh, uh, both Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb are both coming off of reconstructive mm -hmm. surgeries. We don't know the timelines for either. Uh, if I were a betting man, I would say Phillips is a much better chance of being ready for the opener than Chubb. Uh, he got hurt uh, a month before, and he just seems to have really taken to his rehab well. Uh, but even still, even if you're able to get both Chubb and Phillips back for week one, they're not going to be playing the number of snaps early on, at least. You're going to need to have another strong pass rusher. And Chubb's been really good. Now, certainly it helps that he's gone against Patrick Paul a lot, uh, in practice, uh, I don't think Paul's going to be in their plans to play even as the number three or even four tackle early on. I think this is going to be a pretty true redshirt year for him. Uh, and we've seen why. But I, I think of that matchup, you've got to be the most encouraged, obviously, of Chop because he's been he's been beating the, a second round pick pretty regularly in practice. All right. So now, now before we get to the, the season outlook, let's talk about tonight. Uh, Dolphins play the Falcons. Uh, based on the reports that I've seen, the receivers room has been decimated, at least to start with. They brought in a lot of receivers from outside the room, and I've watched those press conferences uh, with the head coach. And I got to tell you, they're, uh, they're very strange, <laughs> to say the least. I don't know what to make of them. Uh, who, who do we expect to see play tonight on the side of the Dolphins? Anybody of interest? You're going to see meaningful snaps from the likes of Willie Sneed, Malik Washington. Uh, I don't even know if they're going to play River Craycraft tonight because 
usually the first uh, preseason game is truly a backups game for the Dolphins. If there's, a, you know, some of these position battles like interior uh, defensive line safety where they need to have clarity as early as possible, those guys will play. But if you know you're on the team and you have a pretty good idea of what your role is, you're not going to see the field much tonight. So, uh, yeah, they, they need what they need, what they haven't had yet, what they need at some point soon is to have Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, and Odell Beckham Jr. all on the field at the same time because right. they have to have at least some kind of sense what that trio was going to look like. I know they have a vision for all three of those guys. Uh, they, you know, the Dolphins kind of stagnated last year because teams knew on third down just to double Tyreek, they'll double jail, and, and there's no, no other answer. That's all they can do. Right. Beckham is brought in to break that log jam and to really open things up. And they've got John o. Smith as well, who they hope can really take advantage of some one on one. So, all those names I just told you, I'm, unfortunately, you're probably not going to see them tonight. It's just how McDaniel runs his preseason. Yep, and that's the way it's gone for years past, too. Their season win total, Adam, is 9.5 with a little juice toward the over here. I feel like this is a really good number. Uh, early on in the season, we would have thought Miami would have flown over this number last year, and they kind of landed right around it. What do you anticipate this year? Yeah, I think the, the division winner is going to have 10 wins. It had 11 last year. I think it's even tighter. I think 10 and 7 absolutely could get it done, and I think that 9.5 suggests they're going to be in the hunt. They're going to be close to that. It all depends on, to your point, how – they handle that late season, you know, juggernaut they've got of teams. The last six opponents are all going to be in the playoff hunt. Dolphins need to start faster. They're going to have a real tough December and January. Yeah, it looks like the toughest schedule in the NFL the last couple of months. Adam, great to catch up with you. Thanks again for coming on Newswire. I really appreciate it. Anytime, Greg. All right, we'll be right back. He's now an owner of BKFC with us, and we're going to take this motherfucking thing all the way to the top now. Welcome back to Newswire here on Sports Grid. We have some topics to cover here that actually include the NFL preseason, also some college football discussion, and the passing of a legend on the PGA Tour. It's time now for some last licks.
So we got to get this straight here before we move forward. We obviously know right now the New England Patriots quarterback position is pretty fluid. We know that Drake May is going to play at some point. You don't draft a guy that high to play. But they drafted another quarterback, too, that was pretty good in college by the name of Joe Milton. And Milton on display last night threw a 36-yard touchdown pass, which arguably was the best play of the night in the NFL preseason. And the announcers on the game in the broadcast said it's a touchdown for Bazooka Joe, which got social media buzzing. To say the least, everyone wants to call him Bazooka Joe this season. There was once upon a time a tasty piece of gum that you could eat called Bazooka Joe. They still sell it, by the way. Uh, But Joe Milton says it's not his nickname. And to stop, well, he didn't say to stop calling, but maybe stop calling him Bazooka Joe. He says his nickname is Rocket, not Bazooka Joe. So let the controversy begin, because as far as I remember, the most prominent nickname for Rocket was actually Roger Clemens. So I don't know. Maybe uh, he doesn't want to call himself Bazooka Joe, but I got to tell you, it's a great nickname. He may want to reconsider that. Either way, Patriots will play NFL preseason game two, and we're going to see more of this Joe Milton. Really good debut last night for him. Uh, All right, so College Football 25 came out. Everyone's been playing this thing on PlayStation and Xbox and everywhere else. It's gotten great reviews. I know I have not played it. I said I would. I guess I lied. I have not played it just yet. Uh, But apparently, now again, this is according to what people gamers say, is that uh, the game is great except for there's one small issue with the game, which is if you're playing as a non-Division I team, an FCS team, that those teams were made too good meaning that you can go very far in dynasty toward the championship by using an FCS team. And the FCS teams are actually beating the division one teams and simulations. And when you play against the computer as well. Uh, So unfortunately, if you were playing as those EA sports yesterday released a patch is what it's called to sort of make some fixes to the game. It's the first patch that they've given out and they've made those FCS teams not as good as they were so i know that's not going to make a lot of people happy but there's a chance if you're in the middle of playing your season with one of these teams that your season's going to get a lot harder to win a championship as a team from the fcs okay uh don't like to end the story excuse me don't like to end the show with a uh somebody passing away but i think it's okay here Uh, chi chi rodriguez 88 years old lived a great life and was fantastic winning championships on the pga tour But where really Chi-Chi Rodriguez got super popular, people I don't think realized this, was when he went to play for the senior PGA Tour because he played at such a high level for a long time and had that signature sword swaddle with with his golf club. Fortunately, I was able to interact and interview Chi-Chi many times when I lived on the west coast of Florida because the senior PGA Tour at the time came through there for many years. And he was just such a fun, phenomenal guy. And what a leader that the senior PGA Tour had the time. Uh, Passed away yesterday at the age of 88. So rest in peace, Chichi Rodriguez, one of the all-time greats uh, in golf. That will do it for our show today. Thanks to everybody who tuned in all week long. And it's been a blast. We'll be right back here on Monday morning for our next edition of Newswire. I uh, also want to thank our guest contributors on the program today, Adam Beasley from Pro Football Network, Jim Ghazali from Legal Sports Report, and Carlin Gay from Sporting News. Uh, great job by Sporting News. And by the way, great job, everybody here at Sports Grid 2 covering the Summer Olympics in Paris. I know it's coming to an end this weekend, uh, but naturally I thought we had a, a really good job uh, covering everything for you here on the show. And if you're looking for more coverage of the Olympics this weekend, and the gold medal games in both the men's and women's for uh, soccer and for basketball. You can download the Sports Grid app. It's available right now on iOS or Android. If you're interested, you could just scan that QR code right there. It'll take you to the app, and it's absolutely free. Coming up at noon Eastern, we have our friends over at the early line, followed by Kaplan and crew, Pharrell Coast to Coast, Game Time Decisions, In Game Live, and tonight, Sports Rage. That will do it for our programming here. Uh, thanks again to our uh, director, Luke, and our producer, Frank. I'm Craig Mish. Hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend here on Sports Grade. I'll see you Monday morning for our next edition of the show as we get ready for week two of the NFL preseason and college football season coming up fast and furious. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you then.